Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> thank you to uh, Raul and my fellow speakers and to the university uh, for having me. It's been a, a really terrific trip. It's my first visit to Santiago and Chile, and I hope it is not my last. Uh, and it's a pleasure also to be at Alberto Hurtado as a fellow uh, 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 Jesuit Catholic school like Loyola University Chicago. And this is part of an exchange program of both uh, students and faculty who have been visiting in Santiago and have visited in Chicago. Uh, and uh, we look forward to continuing our relationship between uh, the two schools. So my um, remarks today will be mostly from a United States perspective. I am not an expert in Chilean competition law or uh, Chilean consumer law, uh, but um, uh, I was present at the 2010 meeting of the OECD where Chile uh, became a full member for the first time and participated in those discussions as a member and not just as an observer. And I've also had a chance to uh, watch with uh, pride and admiration as Chile has um, created the modern structure for competition law and enforcement, uh, first in 2004 and then the changes that occurred in 2009. And I've watched with great interest the increased enforcement powers of the FNE, the Fiscalia, with the creation of the leniency program and the Dawn Raids, and the increased effectiveness in attacking cartels and price fixing. And also, at the same time, uh, the increased uh, enforcement of, 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 of competition law against mergers, um, along with the development of meaningful internal guidelines and the focus uh, on, co on compliance issues. And we can succeed in enforcing competition and consumer law if we can get, obviously, corporations and businesses of all kinds to comply with those laws. In an ideal world, there'd be perfect compliance or perfect deterrence, but that's not realistic. So we need to focus on uh, the laws and their enforcement. And that's really going to be the focus of my remarks uh, in both of my presentations. So for the first half, uh, I want to focus on what consumers want uh, from competition policy. OK, so first, um, you can go all the way whoop, there, all the way down for the lines. Um, I think, uh, I can't, OK, I think it, it's a little bit hard to see uh, from the things, but I, I'll walk you through it. What I think uh, consumers legitimately want, and I, I don't mean all consumers as uh, from some survey or some kind of information. But I think uh, in, in all societies, the consumers who are informed and are interested in um, uh, getting the most out of a, a market economy want a consumer-friendly but competitive economy. And there are many professors uh, and enforcers in the United States who talk about this in terms of consumer sovereignty or consumer choice. You will quickly see that because, although I am from the city of Chicago and I teach at Loyola University Chicago, it's a very different talk than if I was at the University of Chicago. So this is a different approach. But it's focusing not, as Raul was talking about, on theoretical consumer welfare or wealth maximization without respect to who gets that money. But what's in it directly for consumers in, in, a, in a reasonable way that is consistent with consumer rights and yet a competitive market economy. So when I say that competition and consumer protection are just two prongs, two sides of the same consumer choice, consumer sovereignty uh, issue, this is what I mean. First, uh, consumers want a competitive economy that provides meaningful choice to consumers, free from collusion, unilateral abuses of uh, market power, harmful mergers, and also unjustified um, governmental restraints on competition. That's obviously the competition law side. That's exactly what uh, the United States Department of Justice, FTC, Fiscalia, the Tribunal, uh, almost every system, that's what they do. So if you have a reasonably competitive market economy that provides choices, you also need the second part, the consumer part, the ability to exercise that choice free from deception, false claims, 
the failure to disclo disclose material information, post-contractual exploitations, and increasingly um, the ability to exercise financial decisions involving credit, insurance, billing, and the other things that the consumer's law directly uh, uh, focus on. Rafael? Okay, so here's why I'm different from the University of Chicago. Um, this is why efficiency isn't enough. In my view, too often consumer welfare is interpreted as wealth maximization without attention to the actual welfare of actual consumers. In addition, most of the models uh, that are based uh, primarily on efficiency are based on unrealistic and incorrect assumptions about consumer behavior. The perfect rationality, perfect information, low or zero transaction costs uh, work in a diagram of economics. They don't work in the real marketplace. They don't exist. You have to have rules that deal with the, what's called the bounded rational consumer, the consumer who has some but not all information. It goes under the heading of behavioral economics. And uh, as Raul says, I think no system of law ultimately has uh, any legitimacy without some aspect of equity and social justice. Okay, Arfield. So, um, at a policy level, what would be a workable consumer slash competition policy? What do we want? We want deterrence. We want compliance. We want punishment. And we want compensation. Okay. So, deterrence. In an ideal world, no firm engages in unlawful behavior. That's completely unrealistic. So we focus on optimum deterrence instead. However, there is no real world evidence of optimal deterrence in any competition system or consumer system that, that I have uh, had the chance to study. Um, so for example, cartels, very harmful. We can debate whether cartels are the very worst thing in uh, uh, violation of uh, competition policy or, or not, um, but they're bad and every system uh, prohibits them. Uh, almost every system prohibits them almost all of the time. The one area where uh, liberals and conservatives, people who want more enforcement and less enforcement, they all agree, at least with respect to cartels, that um, we are not deterring, we are not achieving compliance to the optimum degree. Reasonable people can differ as to what the penalties should be, whether it's criminal law, fines, private rights of action, director disqualification, other sorts of things, but it's not working. And the basic problem is that um, outside of criminal individual responsibility, the penalties all involve money and usually somebody else's money. Uh, the corporations, not the individuals. And at the end of the day, that's rarely an adequate deterrence. <clears throat> um, next slide. Uh, compliance. It's obviously closely related to the notion of deterrence. I will save my remarks and the details about compliance for the next panel, because I actually think that relates more to the role of competition and uh, uh, corporations uh, than directly from consumers. But again, we need the correct mix of rewards and penalties that will cause individuals and firms to comply with the legal regulatory requirements. Okay, uh, two more. Yep, so punishment. Depending on the system that you're looking at, there are criminal penalties, civil fines, what's called in the United States debarment, which means that if you are convicted or found liable, you, uh, the company cannot bid on future government contracts for a certain period of time. Uh, there are social sanctions. There's the role of leniency programs in finding the evidence necessary to punishment. Uh, I think also there is the need to talk about restitution for consumers and other uh, victims of cartels and anti-competitive behavior if the consumers, the real consumers, are to receive meaningful benefits of the government prosecution, whether you call that a criminal case or a civil case. Okay, next slide. What are those types of compensation? One could be restitution. Restitution could be worked into a system of government enforcement as part of the regular punishment or settlement at the end of a case. 
It could also come in the United States from a separate private action uh, by people who've been damaged. That can be part of a case, also private case, for basic compensatory damages. By and large, in the United States, when the government takes action against a cartel, a monopoly, or a, a merger, um, the bad activity is stopped. Sometimes there's a fine. Sometimes there's a jail. But those government cases rarely provide direct compensation or restitution to a consumer. It's not that big a deal in the United States because there is a very active private litigation for damages where the consumer can get the compensation that way. In systems such as Chile and many other systems where there's not large private litigation in the competition area, you have to think very hard about how to work compensation or restitution into the government or public enforcement or else there won't be any direct uh, compensation to the victims of this behavior. In our system, we also have uh, the possibility of punitive damages and antitrust in the form of triple damages. Um, that's not a realistic uh, solution to talk about in, in, in many other legal systems. I won't spend a lot of time on that. We also have the possibility in the consumer area in private cases of punitive damages when the conduct is considered fraud. And again, that may be unique <coughs> to antitrust. So, um, uh, next slide. In order to have uh, meaningful compensation, you either need to work it into the public enforcement or you need to have a robust system of private rights of action. And I understand that that is just at its very beginning in Chile as it is in many countries. It requires obviously con confidence in the judiciary, uh, the need for uh, private plaintiffs to be able to uncover evidence. Uh, discovery in the United States, you can have other ways of getting that evidence. One way would be to get it from the government um, uh, action in some way. And I think uh, you have to think carefully about how to create some form of aggregate litigation. In the United States, class actions, there's other ways of doing it. I don't recommend that you adopt the full crazy system we have of, of private class actions. There are many abuses in that system. We don't have time to get into the details. I can talk about it in the questions and answers. But here is the basic dilemma. If consumers have been injured to a small amount, but there are lots of them, uh, unless you can bring those claims together, there's no meaningful way of bringing a private case for damages. If you have been overcharged on an electric bill because of uh, collusion or a monopoly, or you have overpaid for uh, a food item for a small amount, no one is going to bring a case for $3 US or you know, uh, anything like that. It's when you bring together tens of thousands of people, that case has uh, uh, the incentive to um, get compensation and, and not spend all your money on legal fees and uh, expenses of uh, other litigation. Okay, so next. Not the, um, not the policy, but sort of the instruments. How can consumers get good laws, good procedures, good institutions, and good cooperation, partnerships between the public and the private enforcement to achieve the goals that we've been talking about? Okay, what are good laws? Um, good laws are laws that work in the particular system where they are being implemented. There is an unfortunate tendency of, uh, <clears throat> of, of public and private people from the U.S. and the E.U. and other jurisdictions to come and talk and do it our way. Um, and unfortunately, they spend too much time doing this, in my opinion, in conferences, in uh, organizations like the ICN, uh, International Competition Network, and, and uh, other international forums. But, nonetheless, we now have 120 different countries, jurisdictions that enforce competition law. Um, what do they have in common? They have in common, they have some rules about horizontal agreements and vertical agreements that injure competition. They have some rules, whether you call them monopolization or abuse of dominance or something else, about the unilateral misuse of power. They usually have some rules, directly or indirectly, about mergers that harm competition. Um, and <clears throat> they uh, often but not always cover governmental restraints on competition. My only suggestion uh, is 
uh, to have those rules be as simple as possible, to be as clear as possible, to know your objectives in drafting those rules and amending them over time, that it cannot just be about the economics, as we've talked about, regardless of uh, what flavor of economics you prefer, um, and not all violations are created equal. I would suggest to you it's not a, a, a helpful debate to say, are cartels worse than monopolies or are monopolies worse than mergers? Um, it's not the legal category that is better or worse. It is whether the individual violation has a greater or lesser impact on your economy and on your consumers. So uh, I'm not suggesting going easy on cartels. I'm just suggesting that when Fiscalia has to decide uh, which case to bring or which case to concentrate the most resources on, uh, or a private party is deciding whether to bring a complaint to the tribunal, um, what's important is how, how bad is the impact on consumers and the economy, uh, not what category it fits in. And whichever has the worst impact should get the, the, the most attention. OK, good procedures. Above all, due process, fundamental fairness that is consistent with your constitution uh, and, and the, the different codes and, and laws that you must enforce. In addition to due process, uh, protection of confidential information, protection of, of, of witnesses, um, and effective fact-finding procedures are critical. Uh, many of you I know are, 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 some of you are law students here today. You study the law, the law seems hard. Let me tell you, in general, uh, when you're working in these cases, the law is easy. The facts are hard. Uh, any of us could tell you in a few sentences what the law of cartels is in the United States or Chile. What is important is Fiscalia uh, to be able to investigate and find out the information uh, that's necessary to show whether the agreement took place and what its effects are, and, and so on for the other categories. So you need effective fact-finding procedures. Uh, the facts are hard to find. They're hard to interpret. But you can't do your job. The tribunal can't do its job. The Supreme Court can't do its job uh, unless those facts are part of the record of the case. Good procedures, leniency programs have proven to be a terrific tool for an agency to have to develop those facts uh, in cartel cases and in, in certain other um, matters as well. However, um, the danger is it becomes your only tool if you sit and wait for someone to walk in and confess that they or their clients have uh, engaged in illegal activity. Good economics is part of the package, but not the entire package. And I would suggest the remedies may be the most important issue uh, of all, choosing wisely between criminal and civil penalties, between fines, between structural changes, behavioral changes, um, that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, good institutions. There are several sensible ways to structure investigation, enforcement, adjudication, appeal. There's no single right answer. Um, in the United States, we've experimented with many different ways. It's changed over time. It's often been uh, just a matter of an accident, history, politics, the legal system. At, at, at some particular moment in time, I'll have a slide in the next uh, uh, session that, that, that says more about that. I think it is frankly more important that the competition and the consumer agencies closely cooperate. I think that's the most important thing. I think that's more important than whether there's one agency that does both or two agencies that do that. I think uh, the sharing and the cooperation is, is obviously uh, uh, the most important thing to me. Um, I'm delighted that there's a lot of good new scholarship that's coming out about this in the United States and elsewhere. Many of you know uh, or know of Bill Kovacic, who is the former chairman of the Federal Trade Commission in the United States. He loves to write and talk about this. He's terrific at it. Uh, many of you know the work of Danny Sokol, who's another scholar in the United States, who spends a lot of time looking specifically at um, Latin America and Central America and the Caribbean. And we, um, we Loyola, hosted a, a symposium with Danny, Bill Kovacic, and many others with the American Bar Association to study this. If you're interested in those papers, they are on the website of my institute, and I can give you that information. Um, and I think, again, we need to think about how to, how to study which structures provide the best outcomes. 
and I was talking about this at lunch today, that in a world where you finally have 120 jurisdictions that apply some version of competition law, we finally have enough raw data to begin the hard process of looking at, okay, do you have one agency or do you have two? Are consumer and competition together or apart? Do you have an expert tribunal or general courts? And we can begin to make rough comparisons of those sorts of things to get some rough ideas of how structure affects outcome. Now, <clears throat> um, in the time I have remaining, I want to talk uh, about really the most important thing, and then I'll, I'll conclude. Um, Public-private partnerships. In every system, there's a role for the public sector, the agencies, and the courts, and the private sector. Whether or not you get to bring a class action for damages, or whether it's easy. Whether or not you get to bring a complaint to a tribunal or to an agency that requires them to take action. There is a private sector that obviously the consumers are part of and are, need to be able to protect their own rights, not just depend on governmental action. In my view, the public and the private are complements, not competitors in enforcing. And the government needs to promote a vibrant private competition sector. That can be in academia, that can be um, non-governmental organizations, that can be in the private bar, through bar associations and, and research institutes and, and related things. Uh, it can be through advocacy groups, such as my institute and another group that we work very closely with, the American Antitrust Institute and consumer groups, and to seek whenever possible opportunities for joint enforcement, joint education, and advocacy, because we're each other's best friends. And uh, in the real world, there are portions of the government that have missions other than helping consumers and helping competition. Um, and that doesn't make them the enemy, but that means a different point of view. And coalitions can affect change better than any single actor. So um, from the consumer's point of view, we, I, I'll end with um, hot, uh, no, uh, one back, a voice in competition policy. What consumers need is a way to overcome their collective action problems. There are many of us, but we're all affected to a much smaller degree than the companies <coughs> and um, uh, some of the government agencies. Uh, consumers lack the information, the costs, and the rewards to frequently come together to represent their own interests and need a way to have access and transparency of governmental processes. In my view, the ability to control their own destiny through effective private litigation of some kind is the second part <coughs> of having that voice. I'll stop here, and I thank you for your time and attention. So I would suggest to you <coughs> that the defining feature of the United States uh, system for both competition and, for our purposes, consumer pro uh, competition and consumer protection was not a well thought out system. It is a system that has developed very, very gradually from uh, the 1890s, e even a little before, um, to the present day. So uh, next slide, Rafaela, thank you. Ah, I hope you can see some of these. I gave you a, uh, just a list of some of the events. Most of the institutions that we have developed in the United States, I would suggest to you, is the product of a particular crisis or uh, something that grabbed the attention of our political actors at a particular moment, and then you, you build on that, but you don't necessarily uh, go back and redesign the whole system from the ground floor. So picture a building that gets taller and taller, um, but was never designed uh, for that many stories. So um, first, I would say the first competition or consumer protection system came about with our Interstate Commerce Commission, which was designed to control the abuses of our railroads in 1870. Shortly thereafter, uh, our states like Illinois, New York, California, Ohio, passed their own antitrust laws. And then our federal antitrust law came in in 1890. And what's happened is, different events in the real world. I'm from Chicago, as you know. If any of you have ever read the famous book, The Jungle, 
by Upton Sinclair about the meat packing industry. Um, he actually thought he was writing a book about uh, the, the, the cartel among the beef uh, companies of that time. He thought he was writing a, a book about socialism and the need for unions. And it turns out he wrote a book about worker safety and product safety and how uh, the meat of that time was uh, disgusting. It was terribly unhealthy in, in many different ways that the book documents. And the result was our Food and Drug Administration, probably our first national consumer protection uh, agency. That's just an example of how a, a, a moment creates the um, political will to do something. So another event in the real world that changed things in the United States uh, was a combination of the Standard Oil decision of 1911 that introduced the idea of a rule of reason into uh, our antitrust law. Most uh, commentators, whether you were co corporation or uh, um, a reformer, hated the rule of reason. The corporation thought it meant that judges and juries and uh, government could decide what was fair and unfair afterwards without any certainty. Uh, people also viewed the decision as weakening the antitrust laws. And our presidential election of 1912, I, I haven't particularly thought about that, but obviously it's 100 years ago, and we have a presidential election coming up. But back then, there were four candidates of major parties, all of whom had something to say about antitrust. Uh, uh, the incumbent, uh, William Howard Taft, who thought the rule of reason was a good idea and that you should administer the law through cases in the courts. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who, who had been president, had retired and now was coming back as an independent candidate, wanted more regulation and more certainty. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, the Democratic candidate who won, wanted a, a combination of new laws and administrative agencies. And Eugene Debs, who was a socialist, thought the whole idea of markets was a bad idea to begin with. So it was our first and only election where everyone, uh, where antitrust was the main uh, political issue. Woodrow Wilson uh, won, and two things emerged in uh, two years later. One was the FTC Act, which created our Federal Trade Commission, creating a second agency that did antitrust, also did consumer protection, and also was supposed to be an expert advisor to business. And at the same time, passed the Clayton Act, which made the antitrust law more specific in particular ways to address the uncertainty of the rule of reason. I'm not going to go through all of these lists, but um, uh, different events of history and civil procedure and consumer rights and class actions and raising our criminal penalties to a felony and pre-merger notification and now the financial crisis of 2008 that led to another uh, agency, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which took away some power from the FTC for financial consumer protection created, so a third agency. So at the federal level, if you're interested primarily in consumer protection, I'm going to show you my best attempt at showing you all the agencies that have something to do with consumer protection. Rafaela? Okay. Because this is a little bit light, uh, I, can I take this out? Okay. Let me show you. Here's what you have. Probably the most important federal consumer protection agency is the FTC. That's here. But um, in addition, we have 50 states plus the, the um, District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, a couple other uh, uh, legal jurisdictions. Each of them has their own uh, state attorneys general who are the top prosecutors who can bring cases under state consumer protection law. I'll just, inside is federal, outside is state and local under our system. So, FTC, they regulate anything that is unfair and deceptive acts and practices. Both competition, but for here, consumer protection. All right? Uh, traditional sectoral regulators, like our Communications Commission, they have a statute that regulates um, telephone sales and unwanted faxes and unwanted emails, that sort of thing. Um, the Department of Transportation obviously has things to do with consumer rights for airplanes, rail travel, 
uh, buses, that sort of thing. So they are the traditional sector regulators that must cooperate in some way with the FTC to have, uh, have this make any sense. I've put the financial regulators in a separate little area. Um, this is just my way of trying to organize this. SEC for securities violations. Um, there are various uh, um, financial regulators depending on what kind of bank or savings and loan or other institution is involved. And then I haven't put on here or I forgot to put on here, can't see, the new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau would be right here. And then in addition, you have the safety regulators. We have a Consumer Product Safety Commission. So if a baby um, a crib is unsafe and, and causes accidents, it can be recalled from the market, that sort of thing. In addition, you have the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, the one that was created back in 1906 because of the book that showed how disgusting conditions were in the meat industry. Uh, obviously, they regulate food, drugs, medical devices to make sure that they are safe and do what they're supposed to do. Um, the National Transportation Highway Safety Board regulates um, safety and transportation, investigates things like airplane crashes, um, bus accidents, that sort of thing. And these are all the agencies at the federal level. I've probably left some out. What else is there? State attorneys general, almost always elected by the people of their state. Uh, in, in Illinois, the state attorney general is Lisa Madigan, who is a graduate of Loyola Law School and is very active in the consumer area. Um, typically, it's, very, it, it's the case for most attorneys generals because they are important cases and they are very helpful for getting reelected. Uh, depending on the state, they will have their own set of regulatory agencies that deal with consumer laws. In Illinois, there's no specific Illinois consumer agency, but there is an agency that regulates um, uh, utility companies that has a big consumer section. Similarly, Illinois has a banking agency that is involved in consumer protection matters, that sort of thing. Multiply that by 50. Technically 52 or 53, but you get the idea. Um, <clears throat> depending on where you are, you have cities, states, and uh, cities, counties, and regional authorities in the United States that have their own um, uh, agencies that do something in the co in consumer area. Uh, for example, uh, in New York, uh, a former professor, uh, when I taught at Brooklyn Law School, he left to go into politics. He got elected to the City Council of New York. Uh, there were ter term limits where you had to leave after uh, two terms. So he left. He didn't get elected to anything else, but he's now in charge of the Department of Taxis and Consumer Affairs. In Illinois, uh, Chicago has a Department of Business and Consumer Affairs that regulates taxi cabs, bus companies, and also inspects retail food businesses to make sure that the scales are accurate as to when they weigh food and other products. So again, I assume, I don't know, uh, Los Angeles, any big city would have something uh, very similar like that. And finally, you have the prospect of private litigation, regardless of what all of these actors do or don't do, the laws, generally speaking, not the Federal Trade Commission Act, but almost all the other laws that I've talked about, provide a private right of action. So for example, uh, I've mentioned that there is a law called the Telephone Consumer Protection Act case. It allows the FTC and the Federal Communications Commission to bring cases against companies that send um, faxes to consumers without permission. It's a very simple violation. It's relatively easy to prove. You either got the fax, you either were a customer of them and it's okay, or you weren't and it's not okay unless you gave permission. You can sue for your actual damages, which are usually zero, right? It's a piece of paper, you throw it away or $500 automatic damages per uh, violation. All of a sudden, a private case, particularly a class action, that brings together everyone who's received a junk fax times 500 for each of the faxes for each of the people, 
suddenly looks like a, a very large um, and lucrative uh, case to bring. So those are just one of uh, a, a large number of, of, of private cases, some of them based on federal law, some of them based on state law. We have procedural systems for combining, in, in sometimes, state and federal claims into a single case that can be brought together. Okay. If that doesn't make your head hurt, let me show you a, a different slide that uh, tells you a, a little bit about um, competition and in enforcement. I had to organize this somehow. I put the DOJ, the Antitrust Division, Department of Justice, at the center. That's their view of the universe. I could organize it different ways. But they were founded first. FTC came second. And some of these other um, uh, uh, agencies uh, came third. I suppose technically the state, uh, the state attorneys general really came first. But you have a potential competition problem. Who do you go to to enforce the law? Who will bring the case? The answer is any of these, and maybe all of them together. Our antitrust division is the exclusive agency to bring criminal cases in federal court. The cartel cases are really what we're talking about here. The FTC, uh, they also can bring monopolization cases, like Microsoft, Intel, maybe Google. Uh, maybe someday Facebook, and they bring uh, cases against mergers. The FTC does not bring criminal cases, but they can bring any uh, civil antitrust case. And, and they have a separate section that does uh, competition. Uh, the sectoral regulators, depending on uh, exactly what law you're talking about, can bring cases uh, certainly in the merger area and others. Um, state attorneys general can bring cases uh, in federal court and sometimes in their own state courts. Uh, and you have private plaintiffs. You have in federal court, in state court, and then at least if you're a company, uh, in, even if you're in the United States, you have to increasingly think about international competition agencies outside the United States. Almost uh, uh, all the uh, um, agencies are adopting some version of extraterritoriality, extra where jurisdiction is based on the effect in your jurisdiction, not where the conduct takes place. My understanding is that recently the tribunal uh, here in Chile has adopted uh, a version of, of what we would call the effects doctrine uh, in, in a cartel case. So there's a lot to think about. Rafael? So this is my idea of showing you what our system looks like. This is highways. Uh, you could think of it as a bowl of spaghetti. Uh, there, there, there are many ways to think about it. There are benefits and burdens of this system. And unfortunately, you can't see the slide very well, but let me just run through very briefly, and then I want to switch the focus from what does our system look like to what does that mean for companies who are legitimately interested in complying with the law. The rules are not that hard to comprehend, but there are many, many uh, people who can get involved, public and private, in enforcing it. What are the minuses? It's inefficient. There's a lot of duplication. There can be a lack of political accountability, because no matter what any one agency does, um, it's not the only actor, and many other people can choose to go ahead and bring the case. For companies who are involved in a merger, there are costs involved because we have not yet streamlined uh, how mergers will be analyzed at the federal level. Companies that are subject to our pre-merger notification have to file identical sets of documents with the FTC, and the Department of Justice. And then the two agencies have a brief period of time to figure out which one will take the case. In general, whichever agency has the most experience with that industry gets the case. Every once in a while, it's not clear uh, exactly what industry is involved, and they'll fight over it. Or the case is so interesting and important and politically valuable that they'll fight. And the longer they fight, the shorter period of time they have under our pre-merger rules 
to actually decide whether the case, uh, the merger should be allowed or approved with conditions or uh, sue in court. And then to have all of these actors that I described, a lot depends on having meaningful access to lawyers and courts because in the end you can't have private rights of action unless uh, the plaintiffs have an attorney. In general, that attorney has to get paid somehow. And you have to have access to the court system to, to, to bring your case to seek the relief <clears throat> that you want. On the other hand, our system is stable as a result of having all of these actors. There was a time in the 1980s uh, when the Reagan administration made a decision to stop bringing cases about resale price maintenance and to stop bringing certain kinds of merger cases. And what happened is the state attorney generals, Illinois, New York, California, Texas, some of the smaller states acting together, brought those cases. And the courts ultimately decided whether there was or was not a violation. But the law remained stable and much more even because uh, you had six or seven potential uh, parties who could bring a case either publicly or privately rather than it all be concentrated into uh, one um, uh, body. Um, it also allows for creativity and innovation. Different people have different priorities in our system, and they can bring cases or choose not to bring cases as they wish. It is harder to capture, to take over um, uh, our antitrust system because there's no there there. It's that bowl of spaghetti where you can grab one noodle, but you can never get the whole bunch. So, now, think about this system. I'm not going to do any more, more, more of, of these slides, Rafael. Um, think about this system from the point of view of the corporation that has both um, obligations and a legitimate interest in trying to comply uh, with the law. So, um, what are the minimum requirements for corporate compliance? And what incentives do they have to um, comply? Well, first, I would say that um, the number one obligation is that uh, I'm speaking mostly in terms of public corporations where ownership and management are, are, are separated. You have the, the shareholders, you have a board of directors, and you, know, you have senior management, and obviously, some managers are maybe members of the board. Um, I think privately operated and owned firms are a little bit different. So first, firms have to have some kind of a system so they don't reward lawbreakers. How do you do that? Well, first of all, part of it's a training system. What kind of training system? Depends on the company, right? It's a, it's a big difference if you're Coca-Cola or if you're some uh, small privately, uh, privately owned company or some medium company that's public but not on the global scale. You might have a couple hundred employees and you might sell a few, you know, several million dollars a, a year but you're not a, a global giant. You need a system of training. You need a system of reporting. You need a practice of auditing to see if any violations have occurred. We were briefly speaking about whistleblowers um, in, in the other panel. You need some system of communication and reporting so that if there is a whistleblower or some other source of information, that person's confidentiality is respected. And most importantly, something has to be done with the information that's received. You can't just have a 800 number and a, a phone machine to take a message. Is the corporation has to do something in response to that. And in addition to picking up the messages when people call with information about a potential violation, the firm has to be active in auditing its own operations on a regular basis to determine if there are any uh, violations. Now, to some extent, what I'm talking about goes way beyond antitrust. It could be any area of the law from securities violations to environmental violations to labor uh, employment discrimination, that, that, that sort of thing. But, but obviously, we're going to focus on, on, on the competition. So 
what does the training look like? What does the reporting look like? What does the auditing look like? Depends who you are. Um, I've been involved in um, uh, different situations where firms use a combination of computer exercises. I've taken those exercises. Uh, they're interesting. They're, in my mind, a good first step, but never probably uh, enough. But how much more do you have to do to do live training, et cetera? Um, I think it depends who you are. We all know, as students and practitioners and enforcers, some of the indicia of an industry where there's more likely to be. Let's, let's just take cartels as a, an important violation. Um, what are those? What are those markers where you might uh, want to think m more carefully about how you do business? <laughs> One is, do you make a, a homogenous commodity type product where it's easier to collude? Do you make salt? <laughs> do you make wheat? Or do you make a highly differentiated product where it would be very hard to collude even if um, you wanted to because the products are so different? The more homogenous the product, the easier collusion is if it's, if it's going on. Uh, are there a large number of sellers in your industry? Is there high concentration? If there are 250 suppliers of tires in an economy, you have, don't have to worry as much if you're talking about uh, an industry where there's three or four major firms, they all make the same good and that they continuously see each other and have contacts through trade associations or other um, reasons. Has there a history of past violations? Not because if you did it once, you're, you know, you're somehow a, it's in your DNA to be an antitrust violator. But, but, but again, if it happened once, at least it happened. There's some reason to think it could happen again. All of those things and more are uh, the subject of studies of economists who've developed actually statistical screens that companies can run to at least tell them how much more do I have to do. Um, so training, reporting, auditing, and I think most importantly is responding to red flags when anything, when the alarm goes off and you have some reason to believe something might be happening. Um, what is it you're going to do about it? The biggest risk in the United States is that companies have instituted minimal compliance programs so they can say to the public, to their shareholders, to the agencies, look, we have a compliance program. We should get some reward. We're sorry it turned out that we didn't detect the violation, but at least give us a small discount on the fine uh, or uh, give us some credit for this in some way. Uh, Danny Sokol, scholar who I've talked about has called this cosmetic compliance where you do just enough to make yourself look good, not enough where you actually will ever detect that anything is wrong. Um, that's not good enough, uh, obviously, in the real world. So what do you do when, you, when the alarm goes off? It depends what the alarm is. Is it just a rumor? Is it an article in the newspaper? Is it an actual complaint from your hotline or your uh, a whistleblower from the inside or from the outside? Is it because you receive a request for information from Fiscalia or uh, the other uh, agencies that, that, that are investigating you? Is it because a private lawyer has threatened to sue you? Is it because you've already been sued? Is it because the competition agency has just conducted a dawn raid on your business? Well, I'm getting higher and higher as we go through all this. Is it because you've already been convicted? It's too late. Um, so uh, companies, and typically the board of, uh, of directors, and in the United States, the best practice is to have at least one board member or a committee, depending on how large the board is, to have uh, direct personal responsibility for corporate compliance for, for all these sorts of regulatory issues. And at least one senior manager uh, or group uh, also responsible for doing all of these things. There's a, a trend in the United States for public companies to have a compliance officer. It's an awkward position. That officer is sometimes at odds with their own bosses. Um, 
<clears throat> over how much you have to do uh, in terms of compliance systems and what to do about dealing with a specific complaint. The compliance officer feels like the good guy and they feel really um, in an awkward position where their own colleagues view them as the enemy. They react to this in different ways. They have um, the compliance officers negotiate in their own contracts protections for when they can be fired so that the, the mere fact that they're doing their job doesn't become uh, grounds for dismissal. Just before I came here on, on, um, uh, on this trip, I happened to go out to a sports game with uh, the chief compliance officer for a beer and wine distributor, uh, a company you've never heard of but has $20 billion of sales throughout the United States and probably elsewhere in the world. Um, and as you might expect, the, the liquor business in the United States is heavily regulated and has many, many compliance issues, and I trust would be just one of them. So they have a very elaborate um, uh, uh, compliance program. If you ran a, a small advertising agency, you might have a very different kind of compliance uh, program. So I, I've given you a lot of variables, but uh, not, not a lot of uh, solutions. So at, at, at the end, um, I think the most important thing is a, a board or owners, if in a private corporation, who take compliance seriously. That means they themselves don't violate the law and are not participating in cartels and related behavior that would get all of our attention. Uh, number two, that they respond legitimately to red flags. The more serious the red flag is, the more action that they will take to determine whether or not that has actually happened and what to do about it. I would say the most important situation, at least in the United States, from an antitrust standpoint, is the decision whether or not to participate, seek amnesty in, in the leniency program. So picture a situation where a publicly traded corporation has real seemingly reliable information that their own employees have been participating in a cartel. Maybe it's never happened before, maybe it's just happened again. Um, the board would normally have the decision whether or not to authorize going to the Justice Department, uh, Fiscalia, the European Commission, uh, perhaps all of them, uh, depending on their worldwide operations, what to do. I would suggest, at least under United States law, uh, if that board chose not to participate in the leniency operation, uh, leniency program, they have probably committed uh, um, a crime that we would call either aiding and abetting the conspiracy or obstruction of justice. So at a minimum, what does compliance mean if you have the board that did not participate has concluded that the violation has occurred, I think they have that legal obligation to then seek leniency so they, they themselves are not prosecuted. Their civil, uh, uh, their civil damages are limited under US law and then they have the obligation to cooperate with uh, the enforcer and their employees would be protected as long as the employees also truthfully cooperate <coughs> with uh, the government investigation. So, there's a corresponding duty. The agencies, just in the real world, I think have a good faith obligation to provide some guidance to corporations about leniency. And I, I'm delighted um, that uh, uh, here in Chile, the, the agency has drafted some guidelines um, recently on uh, compliance and uh, the leniency program. And I think it's not a good sign that in the United States um, there, there really aren't uh, any such uh, um, uh, compliance guidelines from the agencies themselves. It's up to the companies and their advisors to design the appropriate leniency programs. So here's the question. I think it's a hard one because you're talking about carrots and sticks, incentives and punishments. What do you do with a corporation that has in good faith, as far as you can tell, done the best job it could in creating a compliance program. And they just missed it. It turns out that their employees have been, at some level, high or low, been participating in a cartel. And they only learned after it was too late. 
um, but they had a, a decent compliance program. What should happen to them? It's my understanding in Chile, there's likely to be a reduction in the fine. Um, unfortunately, in the United States, our agencies take the position that no credit should be given. Competition agencies, public enforcement, private plaintiffs, all of this is designed, ultimately, to distinguish between just bad guys, rogue corporations who break the law either on purpose or don't care when their employees do it, and good corporations where it turns out there's one or two or three or four bad actors who did this and um, were never detected in time before the agencies uh, took their action. So I think that's, that's the big question. I've given you more questions and answers, but I think that's going to be really one of the key issues in the United States for the next couple of years. We have so many different actors who have so many different legal tools to go after this conduct. Um, the question is, uh, what can the private companies do uh, to ensure reasonable efforts to comply with the law? So, thank you.